after four years, I got burned out. And so I was about to, I, I, what do you do when you're burned out? You go to your manager and you ask for a raise, right? Because <laughs> you got nothing left to lose. Right. So I, I did. And the manager at the time looked at me and goes, yeah, no, we're not giving you a raise. So... <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Ryan, the president of the University of Virginia, and I'd like to welcome all of you to another episode of Inside UVA. This podcast is a chance for me to speak with some of the amazing people at the university and to learn more about what they do and who they are. My hope is that listeners will ultimately have a better understanding of how UVA works and a deeper appreciation of the remarkably talented and dedicated people who make UVA the institution it is. I'm joined today by Jonathan Bartels, a palliative care nurse liaison at UVA Health, who started his career in healthcare in 1986 and has served as an educator, ambassador, and retreat facilitator for the School of Nursing and the University of Virginia since 2008. You may recognize his name if you watched last year's Double Take storytelling event, where Jonathan told one of the best stories I've ever heard in the series. He's also an original team member of the Compassionate Care Initiative at the School of Nursing and is well known for having initiated a practice in 2010 called The Pause. He's received accolades from the American Academy of Critical Care Nurses and the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. In 2018, Jonathan received the American Association of Critical Care Nurses Pioneering Spirit Award. He grew up as one of seven children to his parents in Buffalo and now is a father of four. He's an artist, a mentor, a writer, and a partner in an innovative hot sauce company called Mad Hatter Foods. Jonathan, we're glad to have you back, and thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, President Ryan. Good to see you. Please call me Jim. All right, Jim. I will call you Jim. So let's start with the pause. Um, What is it? Why did you come up with it? and, And what's become of it? Starting with what it is, uh, the pause was a practice I started um, predominantly for my own health because I was trying to find a way to heal while healing, uh, while working in the healthcare system as an emergency room trauma nurse at the time. And the pause was a response to how do you cope with death while working in an ER at the pace that we worked at. And as a trauma nurse, you just didn't know if something else was going to come in, but certainly wanted to denote that in such a way that it would at least uh, cause some healing um, after we lose a patient, which is we could do everything possible, and sometimes it's just a patient's time. And, and traditionally, the response, especially within healthcare systems, was to kind of turn your back and walk away. And so I started this this practice, and it was actually watching a chaplain uh, stop a room and pray, And I thought, wow, that's beautiful, but the prayer doesn't meet everyone's needs. So how can I make this in a way that it meets everyone's needs within that room? And so that's the inception of the pause, which is, you know, to to kind of synopse it or or practice it. Um, You can imagine a patient has just died. You've been trying to resuscitate them in the room. We call time of death, and then someone asks from, from the group that's caring for the patient, could we take a moment to just stop and pause? Could we take a moment to honor this patient's life, to honor the fact that they were alive, they were loved by others, and they loved others? Could we also just take a moment and in silence in their own ways, hold that space and honor not only the patient, but their family left behind and us, the caregivers, and the work that we did to try to help this patient? And then we take a, you know, 30 second pause or a minute pause to hold that space. It's a really simple but completely powerful idea. And my understanding is that it has caught on throughout UVA Health and beyond. Yeah, it's, it's, it caught on here at UVA and, and it's also across the country and on at least seven continents around the world. That's amazing. It's shocking as someone who started something for himself and then watched it grow into something that blossomed for so many others. Right. And my guess is that for the family of the patients who have died, it's probably comforting as well. It, it was shocking because it wasn't necessarily my intent, 
but the pause is a demonstrative act of compassion um, that families can see. They see that that patient counts more than just a disease or more than than a traumatic issue. Um, that we we truly all take that time. And and uh, a, a friend of mine told me about a time her husband died on a bicycle, and he came into the hospital, and she said I'd only heard about the pause and. They did the practice. The whole ER stopped in that trauma bay, and I could feel the difference. And it really, really meant a lot to me. Right. So going backwards, when you were at Double Take, you told the story of your childhood um, that was fascinating, compelling, and, and heart-rendering. Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about your early days and your family life and your eventual route to nursing? Sure. I'm one of seven kids, and a bunch of my brothers and my father were physicians. Um, and if you know anything about physicians, most times they know by the time they're eight or nine years old they want to be a physician. And so my brothers kind of all knew um, where they're headed, and I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and part of that was just the course I had taken as a special ed kid, and then the uh, just the educational pursuits I I kind of went after. Um, and at one point, I, I deviated. I graduated with a psychiatric degree or psych degree, um, but it was a bachelor's in psych. And I did volunteer work for a psychiatric hotline, for a suicide hotline, and. It was, I liked the work, but I hated not seeing the person in front of me because I couldn't read it. And so I realized I had to do something. And so I decided um, to then start to pursue and follow my bliss towards studying comparative religion. So I got, uh, got into Western Michigan University and studied um, Western mysticism and Eastern um, philosophy and Eastern mysticism. And I really loved it. It was, it was, it was cool. It was definitely fed me. Um, it didn't necessarily feed my three kids. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so not, there are not a lot of high paying jobs as a, as a mystic. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so I, uh, I kind of, I, at one point while I was pursuing that degree, I had a dear brother of mine die at 35. Hmm, I'm um, sorry to hear that. Thank you. And his name was Brian. And, um, I was asked to come back to Buffalo, New York, my, my, where my parents lived, and I, I sat with uh, Brian and did vigil with him overnight and kind of helped him kind of transition in the process of dying. And it was such a um, tragic but moving experience that I walked away from it and said, you know, I've been studying this mysticism, you know, and just pontificating in a graduate level kind of course. But what I did with my brother was real and palpable. And so I said, what should I do? And I decided to join nursing. And so I, I dropped out of my graduate program with, with just a, a semester left. And I, I regret that, but don't regret that. But jumped in and, and pursued nursing and wanted to go into nursing so that I could provide the same care that I did for my brother, for anyone's brother, sister, or mother, you know. And that was really my pathway. And I ended up wanting to pursue palliative care. And it was a new field at the time or hospice. But no one was hiring. And no one was really hiring in the Northeast. I was looking in Vermont, looking in New York. And so a, a friend of mine walked up to me one day. He's like, hey, I was just at this uh, you know, recruitment area. And University of Virginia is, is hiring. And I'm like, that's awesome. Because I was down to like my last thousand dollars with three kids, and I'm like, I gotta do something. My brother, my oldest brother, was a surgical chief resident down here at the time, and my little brother was a pediatric resident. So I came down and interviewed at UVA, and believe it or not, Jim, they had a hiring freeze at that time. In oh my gosh, you're kidding! No, <laughs> it's the opposite of now. Exactly. So they <laughs> shut the door right behind me when they hired me. And so I came in in 98 and thought I'd be here a couple of years, but fell in love with the University of Virginia and with Charlottesville and with the community 
And uh, 25 years later, I'm still here. Wow. And when you started nursing, did you know right away that this was the path for you? When I started nursing, yes. When I started healthcare, no. Because when I started healthcare, I was 18, and that was 1986. That was at the height of HIV. Um, it was also the staffing ratios were horrible. And I actually had a nurse look at me one day and, and looked at me and said, I want to tell you something, and looked me in the eye, and I was like, okay. She said, don't ever be a nurse. And I was like, whoa. And years later, I realized her expression was an expression of suffering. Um, she was going through so much as a nurse, uh, you know, institutional violence, you know, just just the overwork and workload that was was overwhelming. So I took that, you know, to heart and I avoided going to nursing. But then once after my brother's care, I, I never questioned not being a nurse, yeah. you know. You're working in palliative care now, but you had worked in the emergency room. You've been worked in intensive care units. Um, so have you gone back and forth, or did it take you a while before you got into palliative care because people weren't hiring much in that area? So I, I was lucky enough. Um, there was a, a guy named Carlos Gomez uh, back in the day, and a lot of people may know him from by listening. But Carlos started a palliative care program here at UVA. And I was an acute care nurse at the time working in transplant. And Carlos was recruiting for his new unit. He had a bunch of hospice nurses, but he needed some acute care nurses. So he brought me in, a woman named Holly Edwards, who you may know, she used to be the mayor of, of Charlottesville. Um, she and I worked together and a bunch of other awesome people worked together. And, and the hospice nurses trained me to do hospice and, and I, in turn, tried to help them out in terms of teaching them how to do uh, acute or critical care. When patients are crumping, you don't just let go. You've got to try to get them to the ICU and and do whatever you have to for the patient. Right. And all these years later, do you find palliative care as satisfying as it was when you first began? So to be honest, Jim, when I first began, we were so new in the hospital that we were more of a place that people were sent to die. Um, so in four years, I can't even count the amount of people I assisted in that process and in the dying process. But after four years, I got burned out, um, you know, because I didn't I wasn't trained to really care for myself. I wasn't trained to process. And so I was about to I, I what do you do when you're burned out? You go to your manager and you ask for a raise, right? Because <laughs> you got nothing left to lose. Right. So I, I did. And the manager at the time looked at me and goes, yeah, no, we're not giving you a raise. <laughs> so a dear friend of mine at the School of Nursing, Gina De Janeiro, looked at me and said, you would be awesome in ER. And I'm like, oh, no, I, I no, I'd never want to go there. And I went down there and I took to it like a fish to water. It was just an amazing experience. I love the dynamics uh, and the, the diversity and anything from psych to an earache to a mass trauma. It, it just, I, the, the, the more chaos, the better back in the day for me. It was, it was really a, a, a fit made in heaven. But then you eventually came back. To palliative care. And is that because palliative care has changed from what it was when you began? It, the opportunity arose for me to then move into a position um, that a, a dear friend Karen Boyle was working in and she retired um, and they needed a nurse liaison type of position. So I moved into that and actually was able to define that role further as we hired new, more nurse practitioners into our group and as we uh, kind of moved through um, learning as we went along. Yeah. yeah. And what are the, what's the range of patients who are um, in pa palliative care? And, and to what extent are palliative care and hospice alike and different? So palliative care, 
We care for anyone with a life-limiting illness. That's really one of the stop gaps for us is you have to have an illness that's life-limiting. That's anywhere from cancer to ALS to liver failure to cardiac failure. And what we do is we come in and we can come at any point during the diagnosis. And our goals are, are twofold. One is to help control your symptoms and improve your quality of life. Um, the other is at some point and at some junction in your life where you have to make decisions that are difficult, we help you both identify what your goals are and advocate for you and also help to kind of relay whatever information needs to be relayed at that junction to you. Um, I'll, I'll never forget, I was taking care of, of an anthropologist from UVA, and she had a bunch of sons that were all academic, and we met as a group to try to decide what to do next for this, for this awesome academic. And her granddaughter came in the room, and as we're going around introducing ourselves, her name was Rose, she looked at me, and she said, well, what do you do, sir? And I said, I'm palliative care. And she said, oh, Grant, you're the truth teller. And I'm like, yes, I love that. I love that phrase. I love that statement. And I've kept that since then because that's what we do is help both speak your truth and then speak the truth of your illness you know, at the same time. That captures it so well. My father-in-law died of cancer not too long ago, um, had a palliative care nurse who would come to his home. And I can tell you, the difference in his outlook and our entire family's outlook changed in part because I think he felt like he had someone who was listening, like really listening to him and who was a partner. Um, and I just think that gave him so much comfort and reassurance that he wasn't walking this completely unfamiliar path alone. And that's really the heart of compassion, right, Jim? So if you look at, uh, if you break down like empathy versus compassion, empathy is I feel with you. And compassion is I come beside you and I help you through that process together. So you're not alone. And that's that's really what I would define as, as compassion and compassionate acts. Yeah. So speaking of um, compassion, um, you've been involved with the Compassionate Care Initiative um, at the School of Nursing. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, a, a, a dear friend um, donated some money to UVA, and she was married to a guy named John Kluge. Her name was Maria Tusi Kluge. And Maria um, met Dory Fontaine when Dory first came. And the, former Maria, dean, the former dean of the nursing school. Yes, Dory, right. Dory Fontaine, the dean of the nursing school. I'm sorry, I should identify. No, no, no. Thank you. It's, that's Thank my you. job. <laughs> <laughs> but to see Maria had a vision. Um, she had lost a child in her first marriage to a medical error. And she saw the damage that had done. Um, and she wanted to find a way to have care providers that are in training learn ways to do self-compassion and do self-care so that they can apply and integrate and bake that into what they do every day when they're working with patients. And so I've had the, the pure pleasure of working and, and running retreats uh, with people like Susan Bauer Wu, who's now the head of Mind and Life, um, with Maria Tusi Kluge. And with so many others, um, a friend of mine, Esther Golzano, who is uh, over at Centera, who's now implemented these retreats over there. Um, and what we do is we, we just give people an eight-hour day uh, of just self-care and, and, and also have them kind of experience that themselves by us caring for them. Um, and uh, I had a, I'll never forget, a... Uh, a young man who was at UVA School of Nursing, who before August 12th, um, he had come to me to say, I want to do this retreat because I've been in the military. And he said, what it felt like for me after getting back from Afghanistan was like an R&R. &R &R, and I loved it. And I want to do that for the surgical ICU. 
So we coordinated with the surgical ICU, and this is the baffling thing, Jim. It was We had the retreat on the day of August 12th because we didn't know what was going to happen, but we wanted to go ahead with it. So these nurses did a full day of the retreat, and then at the end of the re retreat, I do this practice called loving kindness. It's a meditation. As soon as I got done, all their phones started ringing. And we, they were notified of the mass casualty incidents as they were coming in. So they immediately left my retreat and went into the ICU, went into the ER, and provided the care um, that day. Right. Holy cow. Um, so I've always wondered whether the idea of compassionate care could be extended to other professions where um, the, the, the jobs are incredibly important and, and incredibly hard, and so you see a decent amount of burnout. So I've wondered um, whether there should be something similar for teachers, for example. Definitely there should be. Um, there's a, a, a group that I know, Holistic Health, that's been doing this both for teachers and for students, um, and they're out of Baltimore. Um, uh, there are two brothers and and a friend that have been doing this. So it is being done, and I know um, Maria Tusi Klugi also did that here in Charlottesville for teachers in the community. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. That was her next focus, was really to try to have teachers start to experience some of that. Right. And is it sometimes hard to persuade people to participate? Because I would think that caregivers are the type who would be reluctant to think about themselves and feel like this is self-indulgent. Like my job is to care for others. Like I, I don't need this or it's, um, I, I don't deserve this. It definitely it can be for certain people. Um, we're bringing in what I tell them is we're bringing you grandmother wisdom. Um, we're not bringing you anything that, you know, and at the end of the day, you might be like, oh, my God, this guy's Captain Obvious. But at the same time, not Captain Obvious, you know. <laughs> and so, yes, it's hard. But once people realize, um, you know, COVID unleashed a lot of stuff, right? And and, and the Lorna Breen Foundation, before that was happening, we were doing this for the last eight, nine years with our students and with other healthcare institutions because we recognized there were so many Lorna Breens out there, man. So many people that I helped train in the ER that ended up dying either at their own hand or because of just, you know, not treating themselves well. And that's that goes across all disciplines. Um we have to heal while healing. We just have to. So I'm curious, has your experience as a father influenced the way you approach your work? At times, Jim. Um, at times. Especially, uh, I recall taking care of a young child, and he had died of, of a, an accident. And I'll never forget, he was in pediatrics, and the nurses asked me, could you come in here and could you help take care of this kid? We're moms and we're having a hard time doing this. And I looked at my orientee, Tim, and I said, Tim, let's do this. Let's go. In my head, I'm looking at this child who's died in the bed. And all I see is my own child. That's all I could feel. But we did. We supported the family. We worked through it. Um, but it's instances like those that it really, for me, it increases the value I have with my family, my children that are now all adults to really embrace those moments that we have because, you know, it's not cliche. Right. Life, right. life passes like a lightning bolt. Yeah. Well, and you, you know? see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So last question, completely different direction. Talk to me about hot sauce. All right. <laughs> Do you want the pitch? The, yeah. So Mad Hatter Foods is 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 a super condiment. It's a dip. <laughs> it's a salsa. It's a marinade. Um, it's got a. It's not an all or vinegar base. It's olive oil, and it's a habanero. And we have three different flavors. So how, where hot, did this hot, come from? <laughs> A couple friends of mine had started doing this. They called it their pagan breakfast, and they would make this sauce, and they didn't have a name for it, and they would give it away like moonshine. 
and everyone loved it. They just wanted more of it. And they decided to try to go legit with it. And at even one point, one of my, two of my partners at the time uh, did the incubator po- program over at Darden. Oh, no kidding. So that, yeah. So they did that, that whole program and uh, we're still kicking and we're still alive, you know, seven, eight years later. And, you know, loving it I, right now my partner is uh nathan west his mom june west um teaches at darden um you may know her yeah yeah she's a professor over yeah. there but you know that's that's where it started i just enjoyed cooking with these guys and putting on some heavy metal or whatever music we got going and just making sauce it was wonderful <laughs> well jonathan i gotta say thank you um so much uh for taking the time to be on the podcast but more importantly Thanks for all you've done, not just for UVA, but uh, especially for the patients who've been lucky enough to cross paths with you. I've been blessed, Jim, and and I'm just grateful to the universe for the opportunity to be where I am. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Inside UVA is a production of WTJU 91.1 FM and the Office of the President at the University of Virginia. Inside UVA is produced by Kaylee Overmeyer, Arian Ballou, Mary Garner McGee, and Matt Weber. We also want to thank Maria Jones and McGregor McCants. Our music is turning to you from Blue Dot Sessions. Listen and subscribe to Inside UVA on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back soon with another conversation about the life of the university.